As you add heat to a certain object, not only do you raise its temperature by making each of its molecules go faster, but at a certain point, they also change state. You must have seen this before. As you heat things up, things go from solid to liquid to gas. And these are the three phases that you would mainly see in your everyday life. In water, we call that ice, water to steam. All these three things are the same substance, H2O, but at different temperature, they behave slightly differently. And so to turn from a solid into liquid, not only do you have to make each of the molecule move faster, raise its temperature, you also need to rip off one of these molecules from all its neighbor so that it can now act like water that has enough room to slide past each other which is what liquid is. And again, if you want to make it into a gas, so they're so far apart, they don't barely interact with each other, you need to once again rip that water molecule away from its neighbor. And associated with that, you have to overcome some kind of attractive force in order to break it away from its neighbor. And therefore, you have to add a little bit more energy to make that happen. So there's a bit of energy associated with changing state more so than just simply changing the temperature. And of course, we can plot out the attractive forces of a particular molecule with all its neighbors, find out how much energy you need to actually rip out that particular molecule and then sum it all up. But again, that's very complex, not too functionally useful for making prediction. So we again abstract all that away and give you a value you can look up in the lookup table. And that particular value we call the latent heat coefficient. How latent heat works is we measure, if we want to melt away one kilogram of water, how much energy does it take? And then we can work out this coefficient because it should scale with the amount of the particular substance that we have. There is a number that's associated with changing solid to liquid and vice versa because the process should be symmetric. So that's the one associated with freezing and melting. And then you have a different number that you look up for between liquid and gas, which is your boiling and condensing. So let's take a look at, in this question, how that influences the amount of heat it takes with or without this phase change. Part A has no phase change. We've done this before. We're raising zero degrees water to 30 degrees water. So the amount of heat you would need would be given by the specific heat, which for water you can look up, which is a substantial amount of energy. But now we're to include phase change, so we have zero degrees ice in this case. We have to add some amount of energy to make it all change into zero degrees water, and then we raise the water up to 30 degrees. So this part we already have. This part is the heat associated with the melting, which is given by m times your latent heat coefficient. The latent heat coefficient of ice and water, as you look up from the table, is 334 kilojoules per kilogram. The unit is quite simple because we're just multiplying by mass and we want joules in the end. And you can see how this part takes in a lot more heat than the first bit. The total is the sum of these two. So that's 360 kilojoule versus, if you just have zero degrees water, less than a third of that. And sometimes, some people like to do this other calculation as well, just to get a sense. If you take the latent heat, and you divide by the specific heat, you find that for melting ice, you get this number 80 degrees. What the interpretation here is, it takes the same heat to melt one kilogram of ice as it is to raise one kilogram of water by 80 degrees. So you can see how much more capacity there is to absorb heat through phase changes. And then verbally, just answering part C, it falls out directly from the numbers. You can, the ice can absorb three times as much heat as the cold water in order to reach the same temperature because you have to add in a substantial amount of heat to change the ice into water first before you can 
raise the temperature of that water. Also, as it changes phase, it maintains at zero degrees, which makes a larger temperature difference, which helps drive the rate of heat transfer. But that we'll look at next week.